screen and see that we have now started the recording. So um, hello to all those watching the recording. Okay, hopefully folks can see my screen at this point. Um, and pardon me while I get my Zoom set up going. Um, kind of like to see everybody and have access to the chat while I do this. Okay, so um, we're all here today to review the uh, process by which your projects will be evaluated. So what we're going to cover includes um, both the renewal evaluation scoring metrics and all that stuff, but also the COC funding policies um, as well. So let's get going. Um, got a lot of material to cover today. Um, and I'll probably work through it fairly quickly. If folks have any questions along the way, feel free to use the chat um, to ask the questions, raise your hand. Um, if I need to slow down, let me know. Um, I'm, I'm happy to sort of linger on any specific thing that folks have questions about or come back to it. I do have some breaks throughout for, for questions. Um, so feel free to just, you know, ask your questions when we have those breaks or put stuff into the chat. And Erin, I think, is going to be monitoring that um, throughout my part of the presentation. Um, so we can hopefully get any questions answered quickly. Um, what we're going to cover today, we're going to talk through the COC's funding policies first. Um, we'll look at some of the, the changes that have occurred. Um, this covers a lot of different areas, the funding policies, um, including the work that um, you're being asked to do in terms of evaluation. Um, but there are lots of sort of parts of that that connect together. So we'll go through all of those. Uh, and then we'll talk about the application and scoring tools for the renewal projects. Um, we're specifically covering uh, PSH, rapid rehousing, transitional housing, and transitional to rapid rehousing joint component project types today. Uh, we'll review the different parts of the application um, and then also talk through some of the, the major changes. And then Erin's gonna do a little walkthrough um, demonstration kind of thing uh, to show you what it, it looks like this year because it is a little bit different. And then hopefully we'll have some time left for Q&A. All right, so funding policies. They cover a lot of different areas. So we're, we're going to go through this um, sort of step by step. All right, so um, just sort of background, um, the, the sort of genesis of this set of funding policies is that um, the COC used to have like different, different documents and policies for all these different things. Um, uh, working with the COC a couple of years ago, we said, well, I don't, why don't we pull all this together into a single document so folks can just go to one place, kind of have everything explained in terms of how this process is supposed to work. Um, so we started to build that out, pull those things together, and then continue to refine that over the course of, um, you know, 2020 and then 2021. And um, this year we did a little bit, um, Aaron did, you know, um, a lot of work really to um, continue to, I think, improve the clarity uh, of the document and to sort of restructure things. A lot of the policies and the process um, hasn't really changed very much, but things have been restructured to um, sort of help folks to be able to understand the different aspects of, of the policies. Um, that's a little more clear, focusing more on process and a little bit less on providing lots of details around sort of the specific criteria we're gonna look at and things like that. All right, so the first section in the policies document is uh, background. And again, this is it's a very brief uh, background, couple of paragraphs. Um, and it just kind of sets the stage for like, this. there's this COC notice of funding opportunity thing that the, the COC has to respond to. And that's why we do this. 
Um, there was in the prior version language around the FY 2020 renewal process because that was an auto renewal. It was kind of odd. So we removed that language and highlighted the FY 2021 funding levels. It was a little bit different last year. Um, the COC, all COCs were eligible for 100% of their renewal funding. Don't know if that will happen this year, but we threw that into this part. Uh, the next section is a funding process overview. This is actually kind of, again, setting the stage for the rest of the document, articulates what the COC's um, sort of uh, purpose is in establishing these policies and the goals, and really talks through sort of like being very clear about what the COC's goals are, right, so that uh, we can be clear with everybody, including the grantees, um, sort of why the, the sort of process and decisions made are what they are, because we have these goals to maximize funding, to uh, create new resources, um, to build upon existing infrastructure to increase capacity and to incentivize all of our COC funded providers um, to keep improving performance and implementing uh, HUD and COC policies and participating in the COC. Um, a lot of this was about also uh, reiterating that we want to have a fair, unbiased, and transparent process. Um, and that is an overriding goal as well in terms of uh, the policies. The next section is roles and responsibilities. This used to really just focus on the, the scoring committee, as it was called. Um, the, the committee's name has changed now to funding committee. And now the um, section actually um, describes what the funding committee does, but also the role of the non-conflicted board uh, members and the COC lead agency, which is had. So um, information was pulled from the governance charter to, to fill out this section. But again, just, just sort of hitting on the, the sort of key players here and sort of what their responsibilities are. Um, and then in terms of what, what are those responsibilities? So the funding committees, role is really to, to dig in to the details um, in a lot of ways on um, in terms of reviewing uh, your applications and um, developing the policies and creating the scoring tools and uh, recommending projects for reallocation, recommending new projects to be selected and recommending ranking. Um, these are all sort of recommendations that they make that are then reviewed by the non-conflicted board. One thing that the funding committee gets to do that doesn't really, I really have to go through the board is um, they identify projects for quality improvement. Um, and those um, are then placed on a quality improvement plan. The board's the role is, and it can only be the non-conflicted members of the board, those who do not receive COC funding, um, their role is to review and approve the funding committee um, membership, but also um, create a funding application submission timeline working with the lead agency. Um, but then they review the policies, the new uh, renewal project scoring, uh, new project selection, ranking, reallocation, all of these go to the non-conflicted board for review and approval. Um, they review appeals. Um, and um, at the end of the day with the full application, they will review uh, the COC's um, application for funding. The lead agency's role is to provide support really um, to the funding committee, to the non-conflicted COC board and to the COC as a whole to be able to submit the application in compliance with HUD's rules and make sure that everything sort of goes in and is submitted on time, that there's a schedule um, and they're really um, charged with providing a lot of the, the sort of implementation administration along the way that it takes to get into um, it, into eSNAPs and to submit all these materials on time. They also uh, administer the quality improvement plans. All right, the conflict of interest policy. Um, this is um, a policy that exists to be very clear about who can and cannot participate in this process based on what is a conflict of interest or what is not considered a conflict of interest. So there's a, um, language was revised a little bit for clarity. Um, things were broken out into sections to really identify like 
what is a conflict of interest? There are some examples. Here's the process that needs to be followed to um, for the, the board members, right, to say, like, I have a conflict or no, I don't have a conflict. Um, the, there was some language revised specifically around uh, to clarify whether uh, funders who provide other homeless assistance funds can participate in the process. Um, and so we wanted to make sure, say, for example, our ESG uh, um, funders could participate as long as they don't have a financial or informational gain. That's the language that is now in there. Um, and then one final note is that had as the lead agency is barred from participating in discussion or voting on matters in which they receive funding. So that's specifically related to uh, the HMIS and SSOCE grants. All right, there's a section that all of you probably care about <laughs> the most, uh, which is on the renewal project applications, evaluation, and scoring. And this whole section really like was revised a bit, really, again, to focus more on process, to be sure that we were being clear about what is the process that is to be followed, um, and to really break it out into these to different sections to be, um, again, improve clarity around um, you know, how, how we're going about scoring renewal projects, who does what, and what is, um, again, what is the process that we need to follow. So there is a section on the project, renewal project factors, the, the categories, the evaluation categories that we're gonna look at, um, got away from being overly specific about this, the criteria and really focusing more on, let's make sure that we're looking at these general categories. I wanted to give some flexibility to the funding committee um, to, um, and the board to add criteria as it makes sense. Um, when it comes to the renewal project evaluation process. The scoring tool development, again, in, in its own section where we talk about how the scoring tool itself would be developed and um, specifying that we're gonna look at grantee debriefs, we're gonna look at um, and data and analyze the point structure, we're gonna analyze um, the data for thresholds and benchmarks. Um, info gets presented to the funding committee for and, and they get to finalize the tools and the tools that are publicly shared and distributed to grantees and that the process commences upon the sharing of the tool. The next step in the process is really the actual evaluation and scoring. And so again, there's a section here, um, now it's own section, which really talks about what is the process, what is this gonna look like? Um, includes a discussion of the data cleanup period, the evaluation launch process, the how the application and submission, um, the application will be made available to you and requirements for submission, um, review of the submitted applications by HAD, a sort of preliminary review, um, and then everything goes to the funding committee for scoring, reallocation, and quality improvement plan decisions. So again, um, there was a language added to clarify threshold items and what actions can be taken if threshold is not met by a project. Um, a change was made to um, a threshold for financials and grant management, added grants management, and adjusted the fund recapture percentage. It used to be, I believe, like 0.25%, it's now 3%. Um, and then change to threshold for compliance added failure to meet requirements in prior year might lead to quality improvement plan. Uh, review um, of funding committee recommendations is done by the non-conflicted board. So the committee will make recommendations <clears throat> on the scoring, on reallocation, and those go to the non-conflicted board for a second review and then they are the ones who vote to approve. Um, the policy uh, describes the notification that needs to occur to all of you uh, to make sure that you are properly informed about your scoring. Um, and um, then there's an appeals option as well. And so that's, that's articulated in the appeal section, but it is noted that there is an appeal option within this section of the policies. Uh, there was a section added on consolidation and 
um, expansion. Uh, there is a, it's, it's a new section really that um, will help sort of define the conditions under which the funding committee and the non-conflicted board um, would allow a project to consolidate uh, so that they get to consider sort of dif different aspects that may impact um, the competitiveness of projects and their flexibility when it comes to ranking. Um, and so uh, there's a list now that they can kind of look at and say like, okay, let's, let's consider these factors when somebody wants to consolidate and we'll make a decision about whether to approve that or not. Um, there's also um, uh, language around expansions. So renewal projects might be interested in expanding their project in any given year. Um, it's just clarifying that that would need to go through the new project selection process because an expansion project is actually in the NOFO process uh, considered a new project. All right, speaking of new projects, um, new project solicitation, evaluation, and selection section really describes how the COC goes about selecting new projects. There are no real significant changes. Again, things have been sort of moved into these like sort of subsections to improve clarity. Um, and one of those is um, there's a, a solicitation, new project solicitation section, which outlines how that RFP essentially, the request for proposals is. Um, uh, what the process is to create a request for proposals. Um, and uh, that would be had develops it. It's open generally to um, everyone. And, um, and the request for proposal is typically open to any project type that the, the HUD allows through the COC NOFO in any given year. Um, and um, then it also details it that along with the request for proposal, there's gonna be a public meeting during which HAD will review the RFP and the application process. Um, for, and it's a required meeting. Um, and that's just, again, to help um, ensure that folks who are interested in uh, applying for new project funds fully understand um, what the RFP says, what the application process requires. Um, the, the next section is new project evaluation and scoring. So again, this part is really about, okay, what comes after uh, projects have, or agencies have submitted proposals, how will the COC go about selecting uh, the projects that will be submitted? And um, so it defines that HAD's gonna collect the information, the funding committee is gonna review eligibility, score projects, make, uh, meet and make selection and ranking recommendations for the board, and that the non-conflicted board uh, reviews those recommendations and makes the final decisions. Um, again, there's an appeal option for applicants not selected. The reallocation policy. So for those unfamiliar with the term reallocation, reallocation means and HUD lingo, when we um, take funds from an existing project and direct it toward a new use. And that can happen either, you can take all of a project's funds or you can take a portion of a project's funds. Um, either way, it's considered reallocation. Um, no significant changes, but again, the content was reorganized into subsections. So we have a subsection for voluntary reallocation. That is when an agency says, hey, you know, I just don't, I don't really think I, I want to do COC funding things anymore, or I don't want to do it for this project, right? Um, or actually never spend down this amount of my project. I think I'll turn it back to the COC because I keep getting dinged on that for scoring. So why don't I just turn in that amount? Um, so those are all instances where an agency might come to the COC and say, I actually want to um, reallocate some or all of my project funds. And um, again, that, that agency has to notify the lead agency. The lead agency then has to notify the non-conflictive board. They are the ones that will review and determine the outcome of a voluntary reallocation um, um, sort of request, right? And involuntary reallocation is when the COC sort of proactively says, hey, we don't think this project is meeting our performance expectations, our threshold requirements, um, or maybe what we have established as the need in our community. This, this project doesn't meet that need anymore. So that language was revised a little bit to be clear. 
about what factors allow the funding committee to choose to reallocate a project, um, but those were really in the, the, the policies over the last couple of years. So the process will be that an um, had reviews projects for, for threshold requirement compliance, has to provide documentation to the funding committee. The funding committee then will review that and they're gonna look at threshold requirements stuff, they're gonna look at performance stuff, they're gonna look at the needs in the, co the community and they can make uh, recommendations to the board around any projects that they think should be reallocated either partially or fully. And then the board will review that information and make the final determination around whether or not a reallocation is gonna happen and if it does, the amount. Um, agencies will also have the right to appeal reallocation decision. Um, it's a pretty serious step um, to take funds, so there's always that appeal option. Uh, the use of reallocated funds is the final section in this sort of reallocation policy, and it really, outlines if, if somebody is going to do a voluntary reallocation and agency steps forward, they might be thinking like, I'd like to reallocate some funds um, um, if I could then get those funds back and do something different with them. And, and what this says is that the board gets to make that decision about whether they would allow that agency to, to do that kind of thing. Um, the other option is that the voluntarily reallocated funds uh, just go out to um, to all um, all any agency that might be interested as part of the a, a new project competition. Um, for involuntarily reallocated funds, the policy states that that will be what will happen, that the funds will go through an RFP process. Uh, prioritization and ranking policy. Um, Again, the, the actual prioritization factors um, are similar to prior years, but reorganized prioritization really means when the funding committee and the board, the non-conflicted board meet to determine ranking because all projects that go in for COC funding have to be placed in a rank order and they each have to have their own number. So when they meet to determine that ranking, what are gonna be the, the priorities that, that they can consider? Um, so uh, this has been broken out into subsections um, and there are project ranking factors um, listed. Uh, there's a set of factors for renewal projects. There are a set of factors for new projects. Um, they also specify that the SSO and HMIS renewals will be in tier one. First year renewals will be in tier one. Um, and those unfamiliar with tier one and tier two, tier one funding is, is essentially safe funds. Um, and tier two is uh, our projects that are included in the national competition. We don't know what the line is until HUD releases the NOFO and gives us that information. Um, so renewal projects, the ranking um, can be based on threshold review. Scoring is a big factor, uh, but not the only factor. Obviously the threshold review part is important. Um, prior and current quality improvement plan sort of performance is important. Um, COC priorities and local need is important. And then the overall competitiveness for funding. This is a big issue because uh, the, the NOFO has a lot of rules around tier one and tier two and how that works. And so the COC is always looking for the most competitive uh, scenario when it comes to scoring. Um, new projects, uh, very similar, except uh, you know they have to be able to pass the threshold review. They also get scored, so they're scoring. Um, alignment with the COC priorities and local needs is really important when it comes to new projects. Um, and then, of course, the ability to pass HUD's quality threshold uh, review is, um, is really important. Um, and then overall competitiveness for funding, which can depend on the size of the project, the amount of funds in it, um, and, and things like whether it's housing first, um, things like that. Again, uh, we bolded here, but just to be clear that the funding committee and non-conflicted board um, uh, are able to review ranking scenarios and determine which to use based on the factors outlined in the section and competitiveness for funding and compliance. So those are 
it's not just about your score, it's going to be a combination of these factors that determines the final ranking. In terms of the, the process, um, uh, we have to wait until we know all the projects that we have, including new renewals and new projects, before we can move to um, the, the ranking process. Um, the board is going to review the funding committee's recommendations, and then the board really is the one to make the final decisions on which ranking um, to use for submission. Um, there are requirements. There's another section that, did, that outlines the, the ways that the COC is going to notify applicants and publicly post the information. Um, that all traces back to the NOFA. We have to follow certain certain rules around how to notify people, uh, whether it's they're selected, rejected, or reduced um, when it comes to uh, the ranking and um, the final submission on what is called the priority list. All right, the appeal policy really hasn't changed. Um, appeals for renewal projects allowed for scoring errors, reallocation of COC funding, and um, this sort of improper application interpretation of HUD COC rules or regulations concerning the participation of the applicant in the COC application process. Um, bottom line is we have to make sure that everybody's allowed to participate fully in the process. Um, appeals from new project applicants is really limited to them providing a factual rebuttal of the reasons their application was not selected um, as part of the, the notification process, the COC will tell any rejected applicant why they were rejected, and so they can rebut those facts if they believe them to be not the case. Um, agencies have um, three days from decision to submit an appeal in writing using the COC funding appeal form, um, and then the board has um, seven days to basically follow up, to investigate, to, to meet, to discuss, and then to follow up with the agency in writing. Um, if the, this, this part was added, if the appeal results um, result in a change in ranking, then all project applicants would be notified, right? So um, there are some, some circumstances where that happens. Um, it's, it's unlikely that that's a thing that happens if, you are following a schedule and can kind of like um, make sure that that works in an orderly fashion, but it, it has occurred and maybe not in the COC, but others that we've worked in. Um, agencies not satisfied can appeal to HUD in accordance with uh, the directions provided in the, the NOFO for that year. So every, every year HUD's NOFO will have a section on appeals and what can be appealed and how to go through that process. Um, quality improvement plan policy. This really, um, again, didn't really change much. Um, the quality improvement plan used to be called corrective action. So I guess that's the biggest change. Um, it's now trying to be a little more, um, I don't know, uh, positive thinking. We're talking about quality improvement. Um, and um, Again, just outlines that the funding committee gets to determine which projects to place on a QIP. Um, the agency on the QIP is responsible for implementing the changes to address the issues. Uh, the QIP placement or outcomes can impact um, project scoring and ranking um, during subsequent COC NOFO competitions, so folks should be aware of that. Uh, failure to meet one or more of the requirements of the QIP may result in the partial or full reallocation of COC project funds, so folks should be aware of that as well. Um, HAD's responsibility is really um, in developing and administering the QIP in conjunction with the agency, right? Um, but uh, that includes clearly stating whatever the issues are that need to be addressed, um, identifying improvement goals, um, stating action items that need to be completed, who needs to complete them and by when. Um, and then HAD is also charged with meeting with the agency to discuss the QIP, to answer questions. HAD will be able to provide some TA or refer to a TA such as HUD TA if there are other issues and we'll do regular check-ins. And the funding committee is notified when the agency is, is officially placed on the QIP and on their continuing progress. 
and can use um, the QIP information to inform funding recommendations. Uh, somebody asked, is QIP in place of CAP? And yep, it is. All right, any questions? I talked a lot. I'm gonna to continue to talk a lot throughout this, but if there are any questions about um, the policies, feel free. I know there's stuff going on with folks trying to get into the Zoom. I'm, I'm sort of just ignoring that and talking right now. Um, but if anybody had any questions about those policies, um, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and just to uh, follow up on that, it seems like it is a Zoom issue with being logged into um, your Zoom account. So we sent an email out to everybody to log out and then attempt to access the link. Um, uh, several people were able to join in that way. Um, so we're, we're not quite sure what the issue is with Zoom this morning, but um, that is a way that um, people have been able to access. So not a, not a solid fix, but a little fix. All right, any, no questions? All right, hopefully that means everybody's feeling familiar with these policies and comfortable and um, there are no big mysteries out there in terms of how this process um, should work. All right, so we'll move on. The next section or the next item we're gonna talk about is the renewal project evaluation and scoring tools. And again, we're covering here the PSH, Rapid, TH, and TH to RH um, project types. So um, one of the things we were, you'll see <laughs> soon enough uh, is that the renewal project application has been pretty significantly revised. There's gonna be a lot of, of the content that will feel familiar, the, application mechanism itself will look a little different. Um, it's for one thing, a single application that can be used for all project types this year, which is yay, hooray, good news. Um, so there's not a like PSH application and a rapid rehousing application. It's just an application that all of these project types can use. What you will get is an individualized project profile in addition that will be sent to you and it has a lot of information pre-filled. And what the application will ask you to do throughout is to look at your project profile and basically certify that the information is correct. And where it is not, you can provide um, an explanation for what is not correct um, but a lot of uh, the work will be done for you already. Um, and that's thanks to Erin, who's been working really hard. Um, she feels like, you know, I already had a lot of this information. We've been doing this um, QT, is it AE now, uh, process. Um, and she already has a lot of this stuff at her fingertips. So she's created um, a project profile that will kind of spit it back out to you. And instead of you having to fill in everything all over again, um, you're just gonna basically check and certify that it is correct. There will also be an application checklist for the submissions um, for the additional materials and documentation that you need to provide. So that um, be sure to use that to make sure that you are um, it, providing all of the uh, documentation needed to make sure that you get all the points that you want to get. Um, the revised scoring tool um, covering the project types um, shows the benchmarks for the performance review and the points awarded for meeting various benchmarks. And it is again, like the application, one tool, one tool this year. So um, hopefully that all of that is a little bit more streamlined. Um, and less confusing, especially for those of you that administered different kinds of projects, like you might have a rapid and a PSH and it's like, wait, I'm gonna make sure I have the right tool and I've got the right application. It's, it's just one um, this year. So materials will be due at, by 4 p.m. on July 14th. Um, just be aware of that. Happy Bastille Day to anybody who's of 
French origin. Um, renewal project application has um, many of the similar sections that it had before. Um, it's, it's just gonna look a little different, but we have the grantee information. Um, we have the renewal project threshold section. There's the performance evaluation section, and then there's a certification. So those are all the same really as in prior years, and we'll go through all of this. Um, the renewal project threshold section will cover, again, a lot of the same material. There are a few things that are new or different, but a lot of it is very much the same as you've been asked to review and sort of certify and check your yeses and all that stuff in the past. So there's a project information section where you're really gonna confirm um, information from the project profile and things like the type of project and the number of bids and households served and types of household and unit composition and all that fun stuff. But it's pre-filled and you're just gonna, again, certify that it's correct. You have to confirm your grant terms. That is the operating start and end dates for your grants. Um, the next section is the renewal project budget. That's again, a full budget will be needed. Um, any grant amendments that you have secured um, from HUD, uh, the COC should know about. Uh, you're gonna have to sort of confirm your match. Uh, you're gonna indicate to the COC whether you are reallocating funds, if you're requesting a consolidation this year or you're considering expansion. Under grantee financials, uh, sort of the same questions around liquidity and financial audit findings. I think the next three are a little bit new, the de delinquent federal debt, debarments, and a sufficient financial management system. But all of those you should be doing and following anyway as part of just being compliant with your HUD grant. Uh, under COC grants management, drawdown of funds, we've always looked at that, right? Um, and HUD monitoring uh, also included corrective action plan updates. And then sort of a new one this year, I think, in terms of what's on the application is valid SAM registration, EIN, TIN. And then this UEI, unique entity identifier, I think is what it stands for, but um, folks should have gotten probably many emails from HUD asking to make sure you have that in the system now, um, because that's a new thing that they need you to do. HUD and COC compliance issues that will be covered. This is, again, should be fairly familiar territory for anybody who's done the application in the past, um, but it will cover fair housing, equal access, anti-discrimination, housing first and low barrier, client eligibility, CMIS participation, CI participation, COC participation, and last but definitely not least, um, consumer participation um, on your agency's board. All right, so those are the, the sort of threshold items that will be reviewed in that threshold section. Any questions before we jump into the, the performance evaluation section? Right. Yes, I unmuted myself because I was having trouble typing quickly enough. That's okay. That's fine. Do we have the opportunity to change our budget line items for grants in our renewal applications? And how should we do that? Can we just put the new um, line item amounts in with the same total award? Do we need to let HAD know? Can we not? All right. So how this works is, and I'll defer to Aaron because every COC kind of has maybe a little bit of a different process. I will tell you HUD's rules. Anything above a 10% change requires a grant amendment from HUD. So you can move under 10% among your budget line items. It would be good to discuss that with the COC and make sure that you're making a good decision around moving funds. Um, and there are lots of reasons why folks might do that, but you just wanna make sure that what you're doing isn't gonna put you in a bad position moving forward and that you've sort of carefully thought through um, the long-term impacts of, of moving things from one budget line item to another. Again, if it's over 10%, um, that's considered basically a significant 
change and HUD requires you to go through them, the, the first step would really be contacting your rep. There are going to be some changes that they will just refuse to do. I will be honest. There are some things they won't let you do no matter what. Um, and there, there are others, however, that they would let you do in terms of the timing. Best to do it before um, the applicate the NOFO is released. Um, my general rule of thumb working with COCs is to not entertain any budget line item movement um, that's over definitely over 10% during the NOFO because um, that stuff really should be worked out ahead of time. And particularly with HUD, where it's at right now in contracting, for those of you who have grants, you might have noticed it's been kind of slow, right? Um, getting those changes through can be um, kind of nerve wracking as you're approaching the, the NOFO deadline. So have the conversation with your rep, determine if it's even something they would consider, have a conversation with the COC, and then see what you can do before the GIW is released. Sometimes when the GIW is released, that kind of can light a fire under the rep to try to move things along quickly um, so that it can be reflected on the final GIW. And that would be the thing that, the timing that you want to, to try to work toward. Um, and Christy, uh, just as a follow-up, my experience in the past, but please tell me if this has changed, just to be clear about kind of timing, if folks want to make a more than 10% change, uh, is that once the G, once the final GIW is final, right, so they release it, we can edit, or if things are incorrect, but once the final GIW is final, they don't let you make changes. I just wanted to, is that? No, it will really depend on the field office. I have known some okay. field offices who have who are able to do that. I would not say the Philadelphia field right. office is one that you want to rely on to, to do that quickly. They have um, no trash talking about them, but it's um, it's a probably a very busy office, it covers a lot of territory. And I, I think that I would highly suggest doing all of this in advance of that GIW, yeah. But if it's a less than 10%, they can um, put that in their application budget. That's up to you all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have COCs that we work with that it's a hard and fast rule. No, you're going to match the GIW. We don't want any chances that things get messed up. And um, one of the other things that you can do is kind of approach your rep to make a change potentially when you when you go into contracting, if you want it for the next contract year. So the, the thing about not waiting right and doing it now is that it will go into effect now right so if you're working with your rep so whenever your grant ends um you can get that grant amendment now if you need it now but if you are waiting then you're going to be stuck for till the next project sort of contracting period comes up so be thinking about it that way too um in terms of like how you want to handle the timing of it and when you when you really want to move those funds around. Thank you. That was my answer to like internally, like I'm pretty sure we need to do a grant amendment and just say we want it to be permanent this time, but I promised I would ask. So thank you for the <laughs> yeah. insights and the 10% flexibility like reminder. Yeah, it's and there's a guidebook for that goes over these things. It's it's almost 10 years old, but it's it's still pretty much what HOD will tell you to follow when it comes to like the rules around these amendments and stuff like that. Any other questions? Can you, this is Paul Calistro and I, I'm sorry, I attended late. There was a Zoom problem. There was a, a reference to consolidations. Can you, did you talk about that in detail? And if so, I can go watch the recording. I didn't talk about it in detail, but the idea around consolidation is that over the last, um, I would say dating back to maybe 2018 or 2019, HUD has allowed renewal projects to consolidate. It has to be under your agency, of course, and they have to be the same project type. That is, you can't consolidate, say, a PSH and a TH into like, some sort of hybrid. It, you can consolidate, however, say I have two rapid rehousing projects, I could consolidate them into a single 
rapid rehousing project to administer moving forward. Um, there's kind of a little bit of a process around that and the COC now has a policy that that kind of request needs to go to the funding committee and that they would review those requests um, and then make a determination as to whether to allow the agency to proceed with the consolidation. Is so that... I, can, I can guess what the pros are. <laughs> the, cons, yeah. the cons are, um, so the pros are uh, administrative, um, administrative streamlining really for the agency. You don't, you're administering one grant moving forward and not several. Um, so obviously on the agency side that that means one APR, it means, you know, one of like one contract, right? All of that stuff. What the cons are, if you're doing sort of some niche things within your different grants, it might be better to keep them separate, say, uh, and I, you know, have a rapid rehousing project and I really kind of use it for rapid exits and I have a rapid rehousing project and I use it for regular stuff. I might want to keep these separate or say I have, um, I have a PSH and I have like specific things around this building going on and I have this one over here and I could, but it's like, nah, I'd rather keep them separate so that I can kind of have a clear sort of outline of like, this project operates this way and this one has this target population operates this way, that kind of thing. For the COC, the considerations really are around the size of the budget and the continued like flexibility when it comes to reallocation and ranking and moving projects around. What is hard for COC is if you end up with like three mega projects because everybody consolidated and then you really have a lot of challenges in trying to figure out how to rank projects when it comes to to that time to do that kind of a thing. And and honestly, if an agency is struggling to it, it, there are things where an agency might be struggling administratively and consolidation makes sense but it might also be true that it doesn't make sense to consolidate for those reasons. Thank you. I guess the, that'll take some discussion and thought before we even consider. Sure. Um, I, I do believe um, in, in that case, Paul, I think first time renewals are not like in this past NOFO, first time renewals were not allowed to be consolidated with any other projects. Um, so that would be something I think potentially in the future, if you guys were thinking about that. Um, I don't know if they would allow it with your well, new project. And, and, and not to get in everybody else's business, but we have a lot of agencies that have numerous contracts. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I'm just thinking about audit costs. I'm thinking about administrative time. I'm thinking about all the pros, like writing two proposals instead of one, reviewing two proposals instead of one. I mean, I think the consolidation stuff, it, it don't know what all the risks are, but I, I don't, I see a lot of pros in it. And you know, I don't want to discuss this at nauseum. Maybe we'll have a sidebar on this, but, um, and I'm not sure I heard why the COC might be reviewing it in addition to HUD, but I mean, unless one project ranks much higher than the other, but if they both rank similarly, you know, I don't see, I don't see the comms. Yeah, I just think so it's there... less bureau bureaucracy in my own opinion. Yeah, there are situations in which like the COC, like at the local level will approve a consolidation and then HUD will deny it. Um, so it, it does go both ways too. All right, well, thank you. Uh, if we were to consider consolidation, I guess we wouldn't qualify right now, but what would the timeline be normally? It depends on the operating um, timeframe of the grants. Um, it's usually goes based off so you have to identify like which grant is the surviving grant and it it's a whole thing um if that's something that grantees right, are mind. like interested never in mind. doing um we can definitely um have more discussions about that as you're doing your applications thank you i'll say one last thing which is that we consolidated and it was definitely worth it but it was a process mm -hmm. at housing alliance we consolidated so at, at one point a couple of years ago well um, so I, I i will just 
close with this, and I'm sure some of your colleagues, my colleagues are aware of this and some are not. It is getting almost impossible to get auditors now that want to do not-for-profit auditing. Uh, you know, a lot of the um, auditing firms are now getting out of it and the costs are skyrocketing. I mean, like 20, 30% for audits. And, and so anything we can do to cut the bureaucracy and the review process and you know if you're managing a lot of the agencies on your you know in this business have 15 20 25 different government contracts and auditing firms in Delaware now are basically many of them are getting out of a, a doing not for profits because they can make so much more money doing for profits and for profit and not for profits are it's getting harder and harder to afford their rates so any grant consolidations might help all of us I, in, 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 in that manner. I don't know. It's, it's something that I guess is an outside discussion from this meeting. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think every year HUD has um, kind of tweaked the rules around consolidation and expansion for that matter. And so every NOFO, we're kind of like scouring it to see like what is allowed for for that nofo cycle um and all of that information will be will be shared um when it when it's available um i do oh, sorry i have one quick question about consolidated grants also yeah. um last year we were approved by the coc to consult uh, apply to uh consolidate a few of our grants however hud did not approve it one do we know why or can we find out why and then two are we able to apply again this year to try and consolidate grants? So it's unclear to me what is happening at HUD this year, consolidations. I know the awards list, the way they release the awards list is that even expansion projects weren't bundled into the project that they were expanding. Like they, like everything got listed as a separate project. We're, still just trying to figure out if HUD's just been slow on contracting and is waiting um, on these consolidations. Like it's it's been very strange. You could talk to your rep. Um, I think that's one thing. I know, I think you're with Connexio, right? Um, there was a lot going on with that. Um, yes. So Rachel might have some <laughs> insight uh, into whether HUD felt they could do it based on change in who the applicant was and all these other things, recipient. Um, yeah, stuff yeah. I mean, I'll just say, I'll say very briefly without getting into all the details that um, they have a lot of requirements around, um, like for example, if an organization has, even if, even if it's very minor, like an outstanding monitoring finding that they're working to clear or any, or like HUD's planning to do an audit on, some, if there's any issues at all, um, they really tend not to approve the consolidations. So uh, right. that may just have been a specific, one specific issue. Okay, and then are we able to apply then again this year as a consolidated for a few of the grants? Yeah, so what I would recommend is reaching out to Aaron and thinking about, again, which ones would make sense to consolidate. I don't, I mean, there's no reason not in my, that I know of not to try again, but I think we should, we'd want to ask you some more questions, make sure there wasn't a reason. Um, but I'd, so I'd just say communicate with Aaron directly about that because in some instances, like we talked about last year, doing so makes sense. I'm also going to make a suggestion that, that anybody who's interested in consolidation this year, reach out to your HUD rep now to clarify whether your project is in good standing because an issue that we ran into last year is like only HUD knows whether they consider your project to be in good standing. But during the open NOFO, many of the field offices were refusing to provide information on the grounds that there is this open NOFO and we can't tell you anything about funding for the NOFO. And it was a really weird dynamic. And I thought like that's taking it a little far, but to avoid that, if you are thinking about it, go ahead and reach out to them now because there is no open NOFO right now, right? So they should be able to tell you, wait, is there anything on my record that says I have any of these issues? And we can also follow up and provide you with the list of things that HUD 
outright says, if you have any of these things going on, we're not going to approve the consolidation. But isn't it correct that HUD encouraged cons consolidation when we met with them about two or three weeks ago? They can encourage it, but I, the point is, like, if, if, you, if you aren't in good standing for them, they're not going to let you move ahead. So you're not you, in good standing, you said. If you're not, if you right. have like an okay. outstanding monitoring finding, they're going to be like, no. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Any other questions? All right. I'm going to move ahead. Um, all right, so performance evaluation, I mentioned that um, we have a single scoring tool this year that covers um, PSH, RAPID, TH, DHRH, and even has a line for DB, rapid rehousing, um, separate lines for scattered site and site-based PSH as well. Um, because it's a single tool, yay, everybody has the same, like all the criteria of the same numbers, which is nice, um, less confusing. And um, the tool and the application both will indicate whether the specific criteria applies to your project type or not. So just, just be aware that um, you'll be able to see like, oh, if, if it's not blacked out, for example, on the application, um, it applies to my project type. Um, but if it is, then that one doesn't apply. Uh, changes to the tool itself. Um, again, we added new items, scored and unscored, include uh, metrics that align with the NOFO, always looking back at the last NOFO to think, do we need to add something or change something so that the COC is more competitive? Um, added threshold items into scoring. Um, that includes drawdown of funds, for example, uh, really to make sure that the final score is reflective of, of, of a range of outcomes um, and ensure that all projects have a sort of base value of 100 points. In terms of the metrics themselves, we have a CMIS uh, performance um, analysis was conducted to to kind of tweak benchmarks along the way and to make sure that they were set at um, at kind of levels that are reasonably um, accomplishable uh, by the uh, by all of you by your projects. Um, more flexibility was included in the data quality points, so we'll go through that. Um, and then severity of need metrics were applied um, across all project types. So there used to be sort of like two applied to PSH and two others applied to the other project types, but now we're just applying them to all. And you'll see the, that the point values and the thresholds, um, well, the point values I think are the same, but the thresholds are really um, where we have maybe some differences when it comes to project type. Uh, unscored metrics this year are typically these are added to like basically test run a metric or something that we think we might want to add in the future. Um, so it's added, but we make it unscored so that we're not penalizing you for not meeting some benchmark or threshold that you, you've never been asked to look at before. Um, so that includes literal homeless status at entry, unsheltered homeless status at entry, um, project openings filled by CI referral and percent of participants enrolled in health insurance. So we'll gather information by going through this process. Um, and some of them have some preliminary benchmarks um, that, that we'll be looking at and seeing if, if those need to be tweaked moving forward. First time scored metrics, a lot of these were included in last year's um, uh, scoring and are just kind of like graduating into being a scored metric. Uh, so we have data timeliness, we have non-cash mainstream benefits, DEI, that's diversity, equity, and inclusion assessment, uh, grant drawdown, and cost effectiveness. Here is sort of a summary of the scoring, right? All the scored metrics, uh, what they're worth by the different project types. And as you can see, everything works out to be 100 points. Um, and there, there are the things where 
if they're zeros, they're basically not scored this year, but some apply to some project types, but not others. So um, we'll go through all of these um, quickly. All right, data quality, an oldie but a goodie. Um, this was tweaked uh, there to allow for more points, even if you aren't able to get all 16 data elements under the 5% error rate threshold. Again, we're looking at the APR questions 6A, 6B, 6C, and the project has to have less than a 5% error rate for the different data elements. Again, there are 16 of them. We know some of them are difficult to meet. Um, so 10 points um, is the value if you get to the 16 under the 5% error rate. Uh, if you do 13 to 15, you can get eight points. 10 to 12 is six points. Um, under that, unfortunately, no points. Data timeliness applies to everybody. Um, this is question 6E on the APR. Uh, percent of entry and exit records entered in less than or equal to three days. So again, full points, if you can enter at least 80% of your records in um, three days or less. Uh, if you're in the 50 to 79% range, you'll get half points under the 50% mark, uh, no points. Uh, this was new and not scored in FY21. So this is one of the ones that we will be scoring for the first time this year. And I'll point out, you're, you're sort of getting a preview of the application here and the screenshot. And you'll be able to see along the way as we look through these, whether the project type is sort of blacked out or not, uh, will indicate whether the, the measure applies to your project um, based on its project type. As you will see, you will be asked to review the, the data in the project profile and certify. And if you disagree with the outcome that's in the project profile, you'll have an opportunity to explain why you disagree and why you think it's inaccurate. So that carries through for basically all of these, um, or many of them, most of them. Literal homelessness, again, all project types. Um, this one is new and not scored. Um, but our sort of preliminary outcome is to look for 100% of clients to be literally homeless at entry. We'll look at both um, the APR data on question 15 for literal homelessness and also look to um, whether clients came in under category four, which is uh, fleeing or attempting to flee DV. Chronic homelessness, this one applies only to our PSH projects. Um, and it's question 26A primarily. Um, the percent of chronically homeless households served, if you're over 90%, you'll get full points. If you're from 80 to 89%, half points under 80%, no points. Agencies will have the opportunity, you can see in this box here, um, that you can uh, provide information about households that did not meet the definition, but you have a reason for why they're in your project and that will be reviewed. Disability status applies across all project types. Um, and this is the percent of adults served with one or more disabling conditions at start, um, so at entry. Um, the, this one's different for PSH. You have to have 100% to get the point. Um, again, because PSH, everybody should have a disability to be in permanent supportive housing. Um, for the other project types, if you're over 50%, you can get a point. If you're between 20 and 50%, you get half a point. And if you're under 20%, there's no points. Uh, this was worth 10 points in the prior year. It's just a point this time around. We're kind of tweaking the severity of need metrics a bit. And was only applicable to PSH. So uh, we're widening the range of projects that uh, are scored on this one. Unsheltered, this is new in FY 2022, so it is not scored, but our preliminary benchmark is 30% um, of clients served were unsheltered, it says literally homeless, it should be unsheltered, homeless at entry. Um, and this is question um, 15 on the APR, so really we're looking at folks um, entering from a place not meant for human habitation. And again, um, 
all project types, we're kind of exploring what this will look like for the different project types this year. Income status, um, this is a uh, percent of adults entering uh, the project with no income. And again, applies across the board to all project types. Uh, question 16, and um, that's where the data is pulled from, over 25% to get a point, 20, 10 to 25% to get half a point. Uh, it was limited to cash income. That was the language last year's tweet to be um, from any source at entry. Um, and the upper benchmark was actually increased. It was at five points um, and now one point and was not applicable to PSH, but will be this year. DV status, again, this was not applicable to PSH, but applicable across all, across all project types this year. Uh, we're looking at 14B here, not 14A, 14B, actively fleeing uh, DV at entry. If you're a DV project, sorry, but you should be 100%. So we're looking for 100%. Uh, Non-DV projects, you just have to be greater than or equal to 10% for a point five to 10% for half a point. Um, again, this was worth five points down to one point. Um, and the upper benchmark was 5% FY21, but when we looked at the data, justified um, pushing that up a bit. Another new one that is not being scored, project openings filled by a centralized intake referral. So again, this one is sort of exploratory. Um, this is not from the APR, but it will come from a COC CMIS referrals report. And it will look at the percent of project entries that resulted from a CI referral. Um, so this one's kind of very exploratory. I think we're gonna see how it works, um, but looking for our preliminary benchmark about 85% or more of the entries should, should be from a CI referral a lower benchmark of 60 to 84%. So um, yeah, and this one also will have a, a, an option to describe if folks are entering from outside of uh, centralized intake, you get to sort of talk about that and why. Length of time to permanent housing, um, oldie but a goodie. Um, 22C is where this comes from. This is only for permanent housing projects, right? So our PSH rapid, the TH to rapid and the DV rapid, not TH um, and only scattered site PSH, not the site-based. Uh, the scoring, it was at 10 points, it's up to 12 points. We're looking at the percent of persons who obtain permanent housing within a given time frame, And you're gonna have to look at this one to see if you get the points because it's, it's kind of the time frames change a little bit. Uh, for full points, you're looking for greater than or equal to 20% of the client's house within 30 days. Um, for nine points, greater than or equal to 40% house within 60 days. Then for six points, 60% or more clients house within 180 days. If you don't meet any of those, you're not going to get points. So um, again, just be aware that this one's a little bit different, looks a little bit different in terms of scoring. Uh, so you might want to just spend a little time figuring out if you, if you think you're going to get points there. Um, moving on, increased or maintained income. Uh, this one is uh, questions 19A1 and 19A2 on the APR, includes stayers and leavers. For stayers, uh, no worries. If you have a bunch of stayers who are not yet required to have an annual assessment, they get excluded from this. Um, scoring is different depending on the project type. So PSH, it's worth four points. The other project types, it's worth six and the, the thresholds are really the same. It's just whether you, you're kind of a PSH and you have the four points as the base or the, the six points for the other project types. Um, again, six is the maximum for that. Four for PSH just used to be 10 points um, in the prior year. Um, so, um, and everybody had the sort of same point values in FY21. So this one's been, been tweaked a bit. And I'll, I'll just add for that one in particular, um, PSH projects were given less points there um, and more points in other areas because um, many of the people in PSH are uh, in, limited on income such as SSI, SSDI, uh, and things like that. So they're not 
uh, as able to increase their income over time um, and stuff like that changes. So um, that is to not penalize uh, PSH for their project type uh, and the client types of clients that they serve. Okay, uh, non-cash and mainstream benefits. This one was not scored in FY21. It was a new, um, it is going to be scored this year. Again, this one is different depending on the project type. Um, so PSH, it's at two and rapid um, TH, THR, HDB, RH uh, at four points as the max. Again, you're trying to get over the, the the actual benchmarks look to be the same. So over equal to 60, that should be percent um, for full points. And then half points would be oh, 40 to 60%. And then a point for 30 to 39%. And then under 30% is zero. Um, again, this is one plus source of non-cash benefits from entry to annual. And again, if your stayers have not yet had an annual, their stayers but not have had an annual, this happens in rapid rehousing a lot, they're going to get excluded from this. Health insurance, um, this one is very similar to the benefits, except it applies to all participants and not just adults. But again, one plus source of health insurance from entry to annual or exit. It's new, so it's not being scored. We have some preliminary benchmarks we'll be looking at, but again, it's probably be tweaked. Um, I would say um, it, it, it should be relatively high if you're a PSH provider, maybe not as easy to achieve if you're one of the others. So that's something that we'll be looking at as we move forward. Length of stay only applies to TH. Um, average length of stay for program leavers. Um, so for those of you who are operating TH, um, leavers uh, who leave with uh, less in less than 180 days, you get six points, 180 to 365 days a year, uh, three points. And then if they're over a year, um, if that's your average, again, um, no points. Uh, this was applied to THRH and FY21, not this year. It was five points. So it's, it's, ticked up for the TH to six points. And it was stayers and leavers in FY21. Right now it's just leavers. So a few, few sort of like tweaks to this one. A bed and utilization rate, uh, PSH site-based only and TH this year. Uh, here are the metrics, the, the thresholds are really, benchmarks are really the same. Um, it's just the point value. It's worth more points for PSH, uh, 12 points for those site-based PSH, six points for TH, um, and it's unit utilization for PSH, uh, bed utilization for TH. Uh, was not scored in 21 due to COVID. So it's kind of making a limited return here. Um, I'll also add there that the bed and unit utilization rate for PSH projects um, is equals out with the length of time to permanent housing for the other project types. And then this metric in com combination with the length of stay metric, both six points for TH, um, equal out with that same metric. So um, they do equal out with other metrics that are not being scored for the project types. Um, that are being scored for the other ones. Um, so that is kind of why that distribution looks like that. Christy, is it okay to jump in with a question now while I have it in front of mind or should I wait? Okay, I was wondering um, why the switch back to bed utilization for TH? I know a lot of, I know um, there was an intentional decision to start measuring unit utilization um, and there were good, good reasons for that. And so I'm just curious about the change. It, Matt, it allows for unit utilization for family projects. Thank you. Okay, great. Oh, so. Can, can right, I ask right. a, Thank you. Can I, uh, this is Cal Clark. Can I ask a quick question too? Sure. About that. For, for transitional housing bed utilization, uh, we, we have households in transitional housing. So we could have a family of three in a place with five beds. 
Mm -hmm. So for family projects, it's going to be unit utilization. Okay, so that that explanation that I'm seeing on the screen is not 100% correct. Yeah, so if you look right under the actual screenshot, it says percent of beds or units, and then in parentheses, family projects only utilized by program participants. Okay, I don't I don't see those words, but okay. Oh, I, uh, okay, a percentage of beds and you, okay, family, right, so we'll use units for family projects and beds for, um, okay, great, yep. thank you. That's my bad, my apologies, folks. I will correct that on the slide deck before it goes out. Uh, permit housing stability, um, this is really about the percent of persons um, achieving housing stability exiting to a positive housing destination and for PSH, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Erin, but it should include uh, stairs as well. Yes, yep. All right, so a uh, full point value would be 80% to 100% of the uh, participants are exiting to a permanent housing, de housing destination or for PSH remaining. Um, half points if you're at 70 to 79%, three points for 60 to 69%, anything under 60%, no points. Uh, this was 20 points, it was reduced. Uh, and uh, the lower benchmark was 65% in, in 21, so it's been lowered a little bit. Uh, there are a few destinations where um, they automatically sort of are excluded the, the way the uh, APR calculates this. Um, so just be aware that there, there are these carve outs for these uh, folks who fall into these destinations that they are not included as, as negative exits. Cost effectiveness. So this has been something that the COC collects and, and, and reports out, but has not been scored in prior years. So um, it's gonna be uh, looked at the cost per client served and per permanent housing outcome. Uh, so two points if you're in the top 20%, one point in the top 40%. Um, and again, it applies to all project types. That information will be pulled from the spending report, ELOX, SAGE, and the APR. <laughs> so kind of a whole host of, of data points being pulled together to get to uh, the cost effectiveness measure. Drawdown. Um, again, pulling from all of these same uh, places, the spending report, ELOC, CH, APR, to determine whether or how, what the percentage of funds drawn down was for the FY19 COC uh, grant contract that you have. Um, if you drew down 100%, you're gonna get full points. If you're between 97 and 99%, you'll get two. Anything under 97% is no points. And also that's a threshold issue, just to be aware. Um, again, this uh, tracked in prior years on the compliance and threshold side, moving it into scoring this year. And for that, I'll add that we um, went with the fiscal year 19 grant term uh, because that is the only grant term that every single grantee is fully completed at this point. Um, the fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21 grants are all uh, in flux. Um, so we went with one that was going to be a standard look at all um, grantees for that. All right, I'm gonna to try to move through quickly because I know Aaron's got some stuff to do too. So diversity, equity, inclusion. This one is new, um, sort of like the way we're doing it. Uh, not scored in 21, although HUD, HUD sort of threw out there that they wanted the COC to look at um, racial equity. Uh, what we're doing this year is there's gonna be an organizational equity assessment. If you complete the assessment, then you get two points. Um, if you don't, then you don't get any points. Um, the agency must only complete the assessment once. You don't have to do, you know, a, an assessment. It, it would be the same. It's an organizational ass assessment. Um, and you're not scored on your sort of responses. You're really just being scored on, did you go through the effort to do the assessment? And so please take it, you know, 
complete it. Don't worry so much about, oh, I, I didn't, I, I marked no here and they're going to take points off. That's not how this works. We want an honest kind of look at where you're at when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. COC participation. Um, uh, this one is similar to the prior years, but tweaked a bit in terms of what we're looking at. Um, it was five points, now it's six points. And we're really looking for the voting member to have attended the quarterly meetings. You have to attend at least four, all four of them uh, for full points, at least three for a half points and had at least one representative president at, at all mandatory meetings uh, and COC trainings for the full points at at least 80% of those meetings for the half points. If you're not at the three quarterly meetings and less than 80% of the mandatory meetings, uh, you will not get points. Again, this is uh, the, the COC's attendance records. So that will be in the project profile. If you disagree, you're free to write in the box um, what you attended that maybe wasn't captured. You can kind of challenge um, challenge the attendance records and that will be reviewed. All right, housing first and low barrier, um, largely the same, but consolidated a bit. So this was 20 points last time around. It's now 12 points. Instead of 10 questions, there are six they cover much of the same material. The way this is being reviewed is each question is worth two points. One point is for you providing a narrative description that includes specific and relevant practices related to the question that was asked, the issue raised and sort of the, the question, right? You also get a point if your supporting materials and documentation actually are in alignment with what your narrative says, right? So the funding committees, are going to be looking at both your narrative and then they're going to be looking at your materials. So keep that in mind when you submit stuff. Um, in terms of the what it looks like, again, we're going to have these questions. You're going to have an opportunity to provide your narrative. So um, be responsive to the question. That's my, my best advice when it comes to this, OK? Support services, very similar in the sense like you're gonna have some narratives and the committee is gonna be reviewing your responses and then they're going to review the submitted materials and make sure everything's in alignment and that's what the points are based on. So uh, what that looks like is again, we have these questions related to support services provided and then there's this checklist where you get to check off. These are all the amazing support services we offer and um, provide a, a narrative description as well. Project materials, this one is new this year. Um, it's 12 points. And um, one of the things just to note is that this is really for the funding committee to be able to review your answers on the sort of like compliant throughout the application, but also on that threshold side and say, okay, do we find within the agency's program sort of policies and procedures, intake paperwork, your rules, your lease, all that stuff, does that support that the agency is in fact these things, doing the right things with fair housing, equal access, anti-discrimination, client eligibility, all that stuff. So just keep that in mind in terms of what you are submitting, the materials you submit. You might wanna go through all of those documents and make sure that you are in fact in compliance and alignment. Um, so the, the way this will be scored is that if everything is, is sort of in alignment, everything, you have all the required elements, full points, if there is something that is out of alignment um, in terms of the required uh, project material elements or does not align with HUD's rules, right? You, you don't have one of the required materials or you're not in alignment on one of them, either or, uh, you can get half points, but you won't get the full points. If you have one or more materials um, that are, you don't have them, you didn't provide them, and stuff is not in alignment, one or more, 
uh, you will not get any points. So just be really careful, make sure that you're providing all the materials that you need to, to be able to um, maximize your points here. And this is kind of what it looks like within the application. I just note that each of these areas will tell you what the things, the areas you need to cover are with your materials, right? So review your materials like, oh, do my materials cover this? Did I say this? Um, and, and just make sure that you're attentive to this list and the items included on the list when you're supplying the materials to the COC. Um, I will add here that it, this does look uh, pretty intimidating and intensive. Um, a lot of the information was included uh, formerly in the compliance section with the same um, like headings. Um, and then so a lot of the other stuff are things that we've talked about in debriefs um, or other meetings over the years. So this was an attempt just to uh, lay it out all in one space for everybody. Um, so there's really no confusion or um, subjectiveness around what exactly the committee will be looking for within the policies and procedures um, and the other program materials. All right, um, I'll take any questions that are out there, although I think Aaron <laughs> uh, is often the best person to respond to your questions when it comes to this um, at this point. Um, but I know she also wants to, to kind of give you a little live demo. So Aaron, I'm going to end my screen share. And, but if folks have questions along the way, I think you can continue to ask them. So I have a question, it's cholesterol, and please smile when you give me your answer. Based on your review, how long do you think each application will, we, will take for an applicant and man hours to complete, including attachments? Not a lot because I've already done most of it for you <laughs> this year. Um, the, um, you guys won't have to do any of the work of going through to fill in any of your project application, um, uh, any of the data, anything like that, that's all gonna be provided. You just have to review it and then basically certify whether that information is correct or if you, um, and the only reason that you would have to submit additional stuff um, for that is if it's incorrect and you have to submit documentation for the correct information um, is how it's set up. Okay. And it's Thank probably you. somewhat dependent on the level of like the intensity you bring to it. Like, are you going to check every number? Um, are you going to, and, and quite honestly, are your program materials in good shape and in a place where you're, you're pretty confident that like, say that list, right? You'll be able to submit stuff that allows, allows the funding committee to just kind of like check off those things. Thank you. Okay. Um, and we will go um, through that a little bit more particularly um, in just a second. Um, so these are just had slides really quickly. Um, I'm going to breeze through them so that we can actually spend time on the actual materials, but this is just a broad overview. Um, as far as the NOFO, uh, we have not received the uh, fiscal year 22 GIW yet, and HUD has not made any indication on uh, when that will be available. Uh, we also do not have an indication on when um, the fiscal year 22 uh, NOFO will be available either. Um, so we are just kind of rolling uh, on our normal regular scheduled timeline. Um, this is just an overview of uh, who is on the scoring committee this year. Um, and so uh, that's available. It's also on the website um, for those of you who want to go there to see it. Uh, this is just an overview of all of the different agencies that are coming in uh, for renewal funding this year. Uh, and then we're gonna look at the process a little bit. Um, so today is the uh, mandatory meeting to review this year's submission process uh, and all the changes. Um, the, we will be offering um, TA meetings um, prior to the application being due, uh, and we are operating under the assumption that the NOFO will be uh, released some point in July. Um, local applications are due on the 14th at 4 o'clock p.m., uh, and then we just have uh, between August, September, and October, uh, the anticipated timeline for the review of those uh, and for the new applications uh, and NOFO submission. 
Um, so this isn't very much changed from uh, the timeline that we operated on last year. Uh, one of the things highlighted by Christy, um, which is one of the things that we've worked uh, pretty hard on this year, was to uh, have all of the project data provided to the grantees um, through the renewal project profiles. So the intention behind this is to really decrease the administrative burden of the application, um, and then we will review the profile in just a second. Uh, and we use the same performance period um, for 1.21 to 3.31.22. Uh, all of the APRs have been run and they will be provided to um, the grantees in addition to the renewal project profiles, uh, just so you can see the uh, reports that we were um, utilizing for those. Major application changes, um, just to reiterate, it's one application for all project types. Um, grantees don't need to fill out the data because um, it'll be provided in the profiles. Uh, it is a fillable PDF. Uh, there will, are character limits uh, for the narrative responses, so it will automatically cut you off uh, when you've hit your narrative limit. So just be mindful of that. Uh, and you're also going to have to certify the responses for the applications this year, uh, since you are not entering the uh, information in yourself. Uh, the submission checklist uh, is provided within the application document this year towards the end. Um, same with the tool um, and application resource document. Um, both of those um, have what you need either to submit fully for the application uh, and all resources, um, all of the sources that we use to create the application um, or edit the application this year. Um, and then we are going to go through a format review in just a second. Another major change this year, um, which I'm hoping is going to be a much easier, um, but I am anticipating technical assistance needs. So uh, don't be afraid to reach out to me if you have any struggles with this. Um, so we're going to be using the Google Drive for submissions this year. Um, and anybody who knows me knows my obsession with the Google Drive this year. Um, it, so all of the materials that you guys will need to be able to complete the applications will be provided within um, a Google Drive folder set up specifically for you. Um, so that'll include a copy of the funding policies, the scoring tool, the application, um, the project profiles, and the APRs. Um, and by call of business today, each of you guys should um, email me to let me know who you want the authorized users to be. Um, so nobody will have access to those drives except for myself, um, the funding committee, and um, the authorized users from each grantee who will be able to download and upload materials to the file for submission. Um, you guys will also be submitting your applications through this uh, same folder. Uh, and when we go in to look at it, you'll see uh, that there are two different folders, one that contains all the materials that you need, and then one that's going to be specifically for the submissions. Um, for first time renewals, um, you guys do still have to submit some information, um, but you are not required to create uh, complete the um, performance portion of the um, application because you guys have not been in operation for a full 12 months, so you will not have a full APR, um, but you still need to um, submit project materials um, and answer the compliance uh, and like threshold portion of the application for those projects in particular. Again, just highlighting that the deadline is July 14th at four o'clock and that the materials will be submitted via the Google Drive. Also additional more information on the TA section, um, sessions that we'll be offering. So uh, we'll be offering them the week through July 5th and 8th and then the 11th through the 13th. Uh, with the new format and the submission process, I highly encourage everyone to schedule these. Um, you can schedule them um, utilizing the uh, link in here. I will also send it out afterwards, um, but it links to a Calendly where you can see all the different times that are open and select one um, for your guys' team. This is just a little review process uh, before we go into the actual materials. So um, had uh, myself and um, our team will review all the uh, applications first and highlight all of the important information for the funding committee. 
Um, DMA also assists in, in doing a second review of the materials um, in case we missed anything or um, had like a altered um, perception of something, um, which doesn't happen very often, but they make sure that nothing's missed and that everything's all in alignment uh, with the scoring tool and the applications. Um, all materials uh, are forwarded to the funding committee for their review, and then they meet to uh, determine, find, uh, to talk about the projects, uh, and then determine the final scores, and then appeals may be submitted after the release of the final scores. Um, these are just um, questions, which I will get to in just a second, um, but all renewal applicant materials uh, and funding information can be found on the funding page. Today's materials will be accessible by tomorrow at um, 10 o'clock a.m., which is when each grantee will be granted access to their Google Drive with all of their stuff in it. So that's the brief overview document. Those slides will be available. Um, and now we can um, dive into the uh, actual materials for you guys. Um, and so if you have any questions around those. Okay, so this guy right here is the application. Um, again, a, the application itself contains a lot of the same information that it did before. It's just been moved around um, or made to be a little bit easier for you guys. Um, this mission details just gives uh, a little bit more uh, information on the process for the Google Drive. Um, and we will be looking at that in just a second. Here you can see um, all of these are going to be what you guys will be filling out. So you will have agency name, mailing address, primary contact, email, phone number, um, similar to all of um, what has been submitted before. And then as you move through, um, and you guys saw this a little bit with Christy, you will have options to be able to select the yes or no. Um, this area is where you will be able to uh, put your initials to certify the response. Um, and in here, this is where you guys will be able to enter your responses for uh, the questions if, you, if they apply and if you need to. Um, so all of them will be looking like that and eventually you'll have a full application that's completely filled out. Um, so most of the application questions are largely based off the renewal project profile. Um, so that is what this looks like this year. So this is going to be all of the information that is provided to you guys uh, by us. Those of you who have seen the QTE documents um, will know that this is a little familiar. Um, that is on purpose. Uh, we are trying, well, I'm trying to align the competition documents and the information that you guys see regularly, uh, semi-regularly throughout the year. Um, so that way um, it becomes uh, much more familiar and that you guys don't have to keep entering the same information over and over again and a million things. Um, so it will go over the um, project information. Uh, all of this is going to be pulled from official uh, means like eSNAPS applications, eLocs, um, the COC spending reports that we receive from the field office, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so it will have all of this information in here for you for the different grant terms. Um, we will also be filling out um, part of the expected budget uh, because the GIW is not released yet. Um, we will be calculating uh, what we assume will be the budget on your guys' um, report. And as long as it is not super um, crazy or it's not uh, different due to a grant amendment or a waiver, um, then that is what we anticipate what you guys' budget will be. And this will all be filled in. This is just a blank one so that nobody's information is being viewed by everybody else's. Um, and then we get into the actual performance section. Um, so again, this mirrors uh, the QTE um, pretty uh, significantly, but it also lets you know what the uh, point distributions are. Uh, it also is letting you know exactly where on the APR that that data is being pulled from. Um, and as you can see, all of the outcomes right now say NA, but these will be filled in um, once the year guys data goes in and it will remain an NA if that 
um, metric does not apply to your project type. So for example, if it is a rapid rehousing project profile, chronic homelessness will remain NA because that is not a metric that applies to that project type. Um, so that is pretty much it uh, for the renewal project profiles. Um, again, all of this will be filled in for you guys. And if any of it is incorrect, there are spaces available within the application um, for you to be able to um, let us know if that is incorrect or not um, and what the correct information should be. Uh, and then again, at the end of the application, there is an application checklist in which you can select uh, if you want to. I know some people like to check it off, some people don't, um, but this will go through for you guys uh, what is required for to be submitted for each project. Um, it'll let you know if it's like if it's applicable to your project, then you must submit it. Um, and then it'll also shows you the difference between per project and per grantee. So for example, um, the financial audit only needs to be submitted once for the grantee, does not need to be submitted with each project application, whereas the renewal projects budget is something that needs to be submitted with each project application because they all have different budgets. Um, it, Aaron, can I yeah. ask a question? Is Carol, um, where, so, one of the things that we've been asking for is waivers. Where, where are they going to be in this application? So you, that will be something that you submit as supporting documentation. Um, so for the um, metrics in which that um, adheres to, um, you have that little area underneath the metric to explain um, why that information might not be correct. And then you'll be able, uh, you'll submit supporting documentation for that. Um, so you'll submit that with um, within that structure. Okay. okay. Uh, and then finally, just at the very end is the uh, resource um, document. It is all hyperlinked. Um, so you guys are able to look at all of the different um, documents that were utilized to create the applications um, or provide context to the metrics or other portions of the application um, for you guys. Um, so those are the materials. I have five minutes left. And so now I just want to go show you guys the Google Drive. Um, so we, when you guys, you can see everybody's right now, but when you are granted access, you will only be able to see your folder. Um, so when we go into it, this is what your folder will look like. Um, so you will have the fiscal year 22 renewal project application materials in one, and then you will have the submission folder separately. Uh, so the process will be once uh, you provide me with the emails of those who are your authorized users, they will uh, get access to your folder. Um, and then they will come in here to see the renewal project applications. Uh, so there will be one folder that houses all of the project APRs that were used to make the renewal project profiles. Um, there will be a folder that contains all of the renewal project profiles. And then the policies uh, and scoring tool were included just for reference. Uh, and then you have the application that you will be able to download and fill out um, with the renewal project applications. So once you guys access these um, and you're ready to submit, uh, then you can come into your application submission folder. Um, and for those of you who have multiple projects, there will already be pre-titled folders here for the different projects. Uh, so that way you're just able to upload the project's application and its attachments within the folder. Um, and so that you don't have to email anything back, or forth, uh, back and forth and worry about file size and everything like that. You'll just be able to plop them right in the folder. 
so when the you guys will be given access to this tomorrow at 10 a.m., uh, it will have all of the information in it for everybody. Um, and then everybody should go in to make sure that they have access and are able to see the documents and download them and upload if they need to. Um, and then as we draw closer to the actual submission, if anybody is having any issues with being able to upload documents or anything like that, um, we just want to make sure that those are get, uh, taken care of so that way everybody can get everything in on time. Okay, I know I just blew through all of that very quickly, uh, but I wanted to make sure that we got it in um, before 12. Uh, so now that we have gone through a speedy review, uh, what are some questions that you guys have for me? If any. Um, I had a question about requirements for first year renewal mm -hmm. uh, grants. You mentioned that we're going to need to just provide a participant packet, something like that, and a program manual. If we have a grant that's not scheduled to start until January 1 of 2023, what's our timeline for having a completed program manual to you for the new project? Um, and, and can you speak to that at all? Because uh, we have a, a new grant for a project that um, doesn't start for another six months. So like, how does that work with those? Yeah, um, so we can, um, in the event that that happens, um, we, we would expect you guys to start building those um, documents prior to the actual operating start date of the grant. Um, so that there, those policies are able to be in place when you guys do begin operating. Um, I know Y tends to consolidate their policies and procedures. Um, so it might, I would suggest like either adding in separate policies that meet that or um, like stating something along the line of this grant's not operating yet, but it intends to follow all of these same policies laid out or uh, something of that nature. Um, so that way, I mean, because you the the grants are not going to get um, the performance evaluation, so you guys won't be receiving um, points for those materials. Uh, so at this point, it's more just assuring that you guys are um, are in line to be in compliance with those things when the grant starts operating, um, and so that you're in a place to. Um, score for those metrics when that project does get reviewed for performance. Okay, thank you. Okay. Other questions, guys? Um, I have another little question. Um, it's not, is the source data for the that project information overview summary sheet for the application, you said that's a more formal source than where the information was pulled for the quarterly QTE documents. I only ask that because I know there are little things like our APR due date changed, and that wasn't necessarily reflected in the quarterly um, updates. That doesn't matter, except that it would matter for this to show that like our APRs are turned in on time. So I just wanted to check on that if my question even was clear and all that. Yeah, so I am fully expecting some of the information not to be comp like accurate, uh, which is why there's all of those different areas to um, provide if there is something like an APR change that we weren't notified about yet. Um, the idea behind it is to get the most complete and accurate information for the projects possible going into the competition. Um, but going forward, um, we will, again, I've done a lot, tried to do a lot to align the QTEs with the uh, application documents um, so that as we go through the year, things like that that do update as we go through, if we might not have the information yet, we're able to get that um, and other update it so that we're always working off the most um, recent, most accurate information for the grants. Okay, thank you. That's great. So there'll be space to explain even for little things like the the numbers on our uh, for our on our project summary, there'll be space, space to explain there. I just wanted to make make sure going. Thank you. Yeah. And one thing you can do, like if it's something like an APR date change, like you could just screenshot the screen with the new due date and says like our APR date changed, here's that documentation. Um, and I assume that would probably go in line with a grant amendment or a waiver. Um, so you would also be submitting um, 
the, that documentation as well for other changes. Um, and by all means, if it's something that covers multiple things, um, you get like a grant amendment that will be applicable in the threshold section and down in the performance section. Um, so you're able, if you've already submitted once or already provided an explanation, um, you're more than welcome just to reference that explanation or that documentation uh, further up versus uh, having to resubmit that all again. Any other questions, guys? I know that I know you guys will probably have a ton more when you uh, see your own documents um, and have a chance to look through them. Um, but yeah, any feedback you have or any uh, questions, please let me know um, because I will be more than happy to help you with those. I would just say too, take advantage of the the offer for the the little TA session with Aaron. Um, cause you can probably get a lot of your questions, you know, compile them and then maybe go through them with, with her and kind of hash it all out at one time. Yes. Um, and I have the TA slash session started, um, slated to start, um, not this coming week, but the following week. Um, uh, so that grantees, uh, so that you all really have time to look at those documents, um, especially those of you with multiple grants, um, and compile those questions, um, before hopping into, um, TA sessions. Okay. Uh, if nobody has any other official questions, um, that is all we have for you guys today. Um, the materials will be available um, along with the recording on the website tomorrow. Um, and you guys will be given access to uh, your folders tomorrow. If everybody uh, can just make sure to uh, email me to, by call of business today um, with the uh, person that you would like to designate as the authorized user, or if there are more than one person that you want access, um, just make sure that's indicated so that I can uh, make sure that you guys are able to get into the folders. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, I appreciate your time. I know it takes a long time and it's not always the funnest of topics, uh, but I'm really, really hoping that this year is a much more smooth sale for you guys um, and that a lot of the things that you guys have been asking for um, have attempted to be implemented in, in a meaningful way. Um, so I am really interested um, to hear your guys' feedback after the process is done for the year. Uh, but we thank you all for your time and, and for going through this with us as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>